experimental, that's it. We are just, we got to be experimental. So I understand you wanted to start with a short reading. Is that correct? Or? Yeah. Um, I d when I first started this book, I did not know that in 20, no, 1924, Paris had the, was the host to the Summer Olympics. And this year, 2024, is the 100th anniversary of that, and Paris is having the Olympics. So th that was just great. And so what I had to do, because I first started writing the book, not knowing about that, um, I had to go, after I finished the first draft, I had to go back and put in the Olympics. Now, I am, have been allergic to sports all my life. I mean, you, know, you can take one look at me and said, say, you know, she's not one of the sports people. And, but what the heck? Um, I thought, even if I don't know anything about, oh, which goes to my background, come to think of it. Um, I was a music and arts critic for the Tribune newspapers. But when we had the, Olymp uh, the Super Bowl, the 30th Super Bowl here, they made me go. And I do mean made me because I, had, I have never been so miserable and unhappy in my life as covering the Super Bowl. Because all of these people were talking about points and full backs and half backs and three quarter backs and whatever they were. And there I'm wandering around through the crowd and it was just miserable. So what I did was I put a little of my misery into Zoe. And so you're going to find Zoe is kind of disgruntled through most of this book. But I'm going to read something. The very first chapter, the first paragraph in the first chapter um, to show you how she feels about everything. <coughs> now remember, we're talking 1924, Paris, France. Zoe Barlow ordinarily loved Paris, but of late she'd been loving it less now that the 1924 Summer Olympics were here. The previous Winter Sports Week had been bad enough, but at least the games had been based miles and miles from Paris. Whereas now, from the better part of June and now July, Paris was awash with tourists, babbling in a dozen different languages, getting lost, and wandering into busy intersections without bothering to look both ways. Taxis honked and screeched, and dray horses, never bred to suffer such crowds, neighed in distress. The air was redolent with human sweat, gasoline, and horseshit. Sounds pleasant. Yes, it was pleasant. <laughs> Um, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about where you got the idea for the okay. series? Okay, Th this is going to be the show and tell part of the program. Fortunately, I brought something with me. Uh, as you, most of you who know me personally know how much I love Paris, and I go over there as often as I can. But the very first time I was in Paris, I was backpacking Europe by myself, uh, and that was 1970, yeah, 1976. And all I had gone to Paris for was to just go to the museums, because I was into art, still am. And I fell in love with the city. Just like you can fall in love with another person, I fell in love with Paris. It was just, it, even now thinking about it, I, I'm, I'm just getting chills. It's beautiful. It's physically beautiful. The people are very spirited. Um, and you know, there's another word for spirited. Um, and it, it's, and I always stay, every time we go back, I always stay in the same neighborhood. It's kind of a low rent neighborhood and it's where all the artists used to live back in the, the roaring twenties. And so it's nice to know that I'm walking in their path. But the last time I was in Paris, which was just before the, the, the pandemic hit, um, we came out, oh, yeah, that was also, that was May, May 1st. And um, the students were rioting, which they do on May Day. And they were rioting right down at the end of our street. And then the, the tactical police officers were running down back and forth, you know, with their mace and whatever it was, scaring the students and the students were scaring the police. So we decided to, to take a different walk than we usually do. And we got about six blocks away from where our hotel was, and we found, I think it was three, three blocks totally 
set up in, in flea markets. All of these private flea market people were there showing their wares. So, and let's see, I think that was our first day. And so I didn't want to load myself down with, with stuff that I'd have to carry back to the US on the first day. So I thought, well, maybe I can find some little thing that I can get to remind me of this. Um, so I did find something. I found a pair of gloves. And May 1st, it was not really freezing cold, but I thought I'd have to have something. And I, it t I can pack the gloves. So I bought them. Now I'm gonna show you these. I actually, I'm gonna send them around. They're just, just kind of maroon colored gloves and they've got a pom-pom on the back. And I thought, that is the cutest darn thing I ever saw, a glove with a pom-pom. And so we resumed doing our usual, hanging out at La Rotonde, which I started hanging out at for the first time back in 1976. I mean, there's just something about that particular cafe that draws me to it. Um, so we have our trip and everything is wonderful, Paris is wonderful. Get back and I don't think about it for a while. And then as I was writing uh, the first Paris book, um, I started bringing myself mentally and emotionally back into Paris. And then I remembered something. Oh, I know, I remember that flea market. That was so cool. And as the, the, the little pom-pom thing is making its way around, good, good, don't put it in your purse, ladies. <laughs> uh, I want it back. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe that'll, I can put that in the book, the, 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 the little gloves. No, I'll, I'll, I'll have a flea market in the book. That's what I'll do. So the book starts, The Clock Struck Murder starts off with, with, uh, whoops, let me grab this. I was at another program yesterday, so I'm a little hoarse. That's why I've got this water up here. So I thought, I'll just, I'll, how can I get somebody murdered at, at a flea market? That, that doesn't sound right. So writers being writers, um, I decided I would have two sisters, not twins, an older one and a younger one. And their names were, let's see, Lorette, she was the young, beautiful sister. And then Veronique was her sister. And they ran this, this, this lovely flea market. And what happens in the first chapter after Zoe talks about how miserable she is with the Olympics, she's having her, her weekly poker night. And one of her friends gets drunk, which they all do in Paris at that time, and stands up and staggers and knocks Zoe's clock off a table. So she has to replace her clock. And so the next morning, she goes down to the flea market and she tells, uh, let's say, Lorette, yeah, she tells Lorette, I need a clock because somebody, a friend of mine broke my clock. And so Lorette, who is not only beautiful, is a beauti is, she's a salesperson par excellence, and gets, gets, she, she gets Zoe to buy one of the more expensive clocks, but she throws in some other stuff. So Zoe, um, remember 1924, they don't have little plastic bags to carry things. Now for groceries, they had string bags but you can't put a very angular clock in a string bag. So the Lorette said, look, I've got a piece of old cloth here and I will wrap it up for you to get back to your house. And so she does. And it's a greasy looking thing. I mean, it's, it's ugly, but th she, she swore that it was dry and wouldn't rub off on this beautiful clock that Zoe had picked out. Zoe gets the clock back to her, her house opens it up to look at the clock, and what does she see? Zoe is an artist. She knows the work of Chagall, Marc Chagall, when she sees it. It's that, pa that clock was wrapped in a Marc Chagall painting. And 
boy, that's when the book, that's when the book really takes off, which is about three, three or four pages in, which isn't bad. I always like to kill, I always like to kill somebody in the, in the first few pages, you know, <laughs> to let the reader know, hey, this isn't a romance. There's going to be blood. So she runs back to the, uh, which is hard because Lo Zoe has one leg that's shorter than another because she grew up on a plantation in Alabama as kind of did I, and she's very adventuresome, and uh, when she was eight years old, she climbed a big oak and fell out of the oak and broke her leg, and so now she has a shorter leg and has to have all of her shoes made by cobblers just for her. So anyway, she hops down, back down to the flea market, gets there, it has started to rain, and they are closing up the flea market. And Lorette, beautiful Lorette, is not there. She's gone. But Zoe knows where the people at the flea market keep some of their possessions. So she goes over to this, this yard. It's, it's a storage yard in back of a mechanic's uh, garage. And she goes into the little little shed that they have there, and starts looking through it, looking through it, and darned if she doesn't find more Chagalls. She comes out of there with something like three to six Chagalls and a bunch of paintings and a bunch of, bunch of drawings and sketches. So as she's tucking them all into her bag, and the bag, that's something else I have in common with Zoe. In 1976, when I was backpacking Europe by myself, because I'm crazy, <laughs> Um, she went to the Salisbury, a beautiful little town called Salisbury, which years ago had the highest steeple in Europe. And I went to Salisbury for that reason, because I, I was an artist at the time, and I wanted to look at this beautiful, beautiful church and its steeple. And while I was there, I stayed at, it's not a youth hostel, but it was one of the families in town that had opened up their doors uh, for traveling students, usually. But here comes this crazy American, and um, I talked, I remember the, the landlady's name was Mrs. Whitmarsh. Lovely woman, lovely woman, and she was so excited to see an American. She says, because last week we had the Australians, and they were just terrible. But anyway, happy birthday, Yank. This is 1976. It was our bicentennial. And she said, um, by the way, and I'm unpacking my backpack, and she says, by the way, have you ever been to Disneyland? And I said, oh, yes, I have. Um, and she said, would you talk to my Disneyland group? Because we're all going to Disneyland next year. And I had not been one at that time to give talks to people I didn't know about things. I, did. I mean, you can go to Disneyland and really not know what you saw. I mean, there's so much. So I said, sure, I can. And so that night, she called up all of her friends and said, um, hey, we got a, got a gal here who knows all about Disneyland. She's an expert. <laughs> so they ha the little house is a little cottage. It's packed with all of these English people who want me to give the ultimate lecture on Disneyland. So it, it was OK. It worked out fine. Um, they asked me about Minnie. They asked me about Mickey and all of those questions. So. After that, I went out, I went, to, I went to Stonehenge, I went to so many different places. Then, when I finally come back, Miss Whitmarsh comes up to the room where I'm staying. She says, how much do you know about politics? And I said, politics? Now, do you remember what 1976 was like? We were all rioting in the streets. And I says, I, d I don't really know about politics. She says, well, you know more than we do, so would you, would you talk to my political group tonight? <laughs> so, let's see, I forget who all was running. I think it was Ford. Um, does anybody remember who was? I, I did some, Carter? yeah, Carter, Carter, right, thank you. We've got somebody with education in the crowd tonight. <laughs> um, so I gave a talk about, about politics because they didn't understand the, the different things that go on, you know, like two politicians facing each other on the stage and throwing insults. They didn't understand that. 
Um, they, they, they're used to having the big, the House of Commons. They're all screaming at each other at the same time. You know, they, they, they weren't into the idea of just one person screaming at another person. So that happened. And then later, after I've seen everything I wanted to see, gone to the Holy Church with the tall steeple, I'm up in my room and I'm packing, packing my backpack. And she said, one other thing, Yank. And they all call me Yank, by the way, and it may be because I had a little, on my denim jacket, I had a little American flag. And it's, talk about a topic opener, huh? So that didn't work as well in Paris, by the way. So, <laughs> so um, I said, yes, yes, Mrs. Whitmarch, what is it you want now? She said, I have these lovely bags that I put together and people find them so wonderful, especially travelers like you with your wonderful taste. And I'm thinking, rawr, rawr, rawr. so she shows me a selection of bags and what they, they were piecework, all different patterns. They were like little tiny quilts sewn together with a golden braid so that you could use it as a tote bag. And this was before tote bags got popular. So I bought it. So Zoe bought a tote bag too. As it comes in handy, as she's looking at all of the other uh, Marc Chagall's in the shack. So she's stuffing Marc Chagall's in there like crazy. And, um, and then as she's turning to leave, she sees Lorette and she is dead. Somebody's bashed her skull in. And there we go with the mystery. And um, does anybody have any questions? Because like I say, I wasn't prepared to give an entire program. <laughs> well, I'll start with one, Betty. Um, this is a historical mystery series. Right, series, it is, yeah. It all takes place in 1924. Which means you can't make everything up. So you no, have to do some, no. some research. How do you research? this series? Well, <coughs> the first thing I do is I, I, I went to my, my files where I kept a lot of my little things that I, I bought in Paris, and I have started remembering stuff. Um, plus, I'd been to Paris many, many times since 1976. And I had a lot of historical ma material already on hand, and I already had dozens of art books already on hand because I went to art school. That's why I, I seem kind of dumb in some ways because I skipped the college thing and <laughs> went to art school instead. Um, I, I did take a few classes, so I'm not totally illiterate, just a little bit illiterate, especially when it comes to geology and science. Ah. So after that, I did what we people normally do. I Google, I Google, I call the universities. And in one case, I, once I realized I had to have the, the Olympics there, uh, I actually had to, I wound up talking to someone uh, on the Olympic committee because in, in my files, there were two different dates given for one particular race and I, since then, I knew I was going to have uh, Johnny Weissmiller, who swam in the 24 Olympics, 1924. So I knew I was going to use him, but the, the, the press at the time were very, very loose in the way that they covered things. And I noticed that there was a contradiction on his times, which lap he ran in, what his time was. So I wound up talking to this nice guy at the Olympics, and uh, he helped a lot. And that's, that's what I did to a certain extent. When I could, I would talk to a person who, was of, uh, who knew what they were talking about. Because even though I could tell you where the best eating joints are, where the opera is, I can tell you all that stuff. But which lane Johnny Weissmiller ran in. I don't, I don't say. And there's a reason I put Johnny Weissmiller in the book. Because Johnny Weissmiller actually, in his innocence and beauty, says something to Zoe that makes her realize who killed the beautiful Lorette and then another young woman at a flea market he just asked this innocent-sounding question, 
And with Zoe's mind the way it is, it went click, 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 click. Oh my God, that's who it was. So that's why Johnny Weissmiller got in my book. And then I had to read histories about Johnny Weissmiller. And I'm gonna, I did not know this because, you know, not knowing about sports, why would I know it? Okay, where we go? All righty, here we go. This is what I found out. And this is the great thing about research. Uh, you will find out things that are so fascinating and for some reason they don't teach you in school. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, Johnny Weissmiller was, for those of you who don't know, he, he played Tarzan in the movies and besides being a fantastic swimmer. Okay, on July 28th, 1927, the Lake Michigan excursion sing steamer favorite sank during a severe squall carrying 71 passengers. Many were saved when Johnny and his brother Peter, they had been on a nearby boat, repeatedly dove into the sunken wreckage and brought the still living to the surface. Early on during the rescue, Peter, who had been trained as a lifeguard, stayed on their boat and administered CPR, while Johnny, the stronger sing swimmer and diver, continued to dive into the turbulent waters to weave his way through the sunken cabins. Johnny, between the two brothers, they saved 11 lives. So these are things that you had no idea about that you wind up finding when you're researching the Olympics. Who would know? And because I want, <coughs> excuse me, let me get a drink of water here real quick. Like I say, I pretty much shot my voice yesterday. <laughs> okay, these are the wonderful things that, that you discover when you d do research. And in my case, I'm what they call a pantser, a, write, a writer who makes it up as she goes along. And in my case, that means I can go back and add real characters uh, to, my, to my books. Some of the other new characters, let's say, real characters. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark Chagall. Mark Chagall's in the book a lot. Um, Bella Chagall, that's his wife. Ida, his daughter. We're talking major family man here. And, you know, the, all of the, the wedding pictures, that's him and his wife. He and his wife, excuse my language. Um, anyway, I, I, Hadley Hemingway. Um, let's see, Colette. Mary Cassatt, Picasso, Gertrude Stein, the poet Glaze Sindrars, uh, and a lot of soldiers who were mutilated in World War I because we're just, you know, we're past World War I and these men who had to go over the trenches, they um, had their heads, their faces shot and had terrible, terrible faces. And so one of the things that Zoe did uh, she painted masks for them to wear that looked just like the person before the ex before they were shot. So there's a lot of heart in history, which I hadn't known. Uh, you, you find out that a famous movie star was a hero. You find out that artists don't just paint canvas. They will paint masks for injured soldiers. Before you were a novelist, you were a journalist. Yes, 20 years, 20 years. Do the skill, writing skills you learned as a journalist translate to novel writing? Yeah, yeah, and especially because, <laughs> in, you know how some people say, I, I was gonna write today, but I didn't feel like it. Well, can you imagine what would happen to a journalist if they walked up to their editor and said, I don't feel like writing today. So that's the part that stayed with me. I, I can write when I'm actually barfing in the next room every now and then. I, and and it, one of the good things about writing, besides all of the other uh, fairly well-known stuff, uh, but such as you're starving half to death because we don't make as much money as people think we do. Uh, Stephen King's a multimillionaire. I am not. <laughs> and I'm still hitting the flea markets. Uh, and we have them here, you know. Um, so. My attitude about writing is I write, period. 
um, and half the time, when I had four, pub four mysteries published by the time while I was still at the Tribune. And so that meant that I had to get up at four in the morning and I would write for four hours um, until I had to get ready for work, say around eight o'clock. And then I would go, go into the office to the, to the newsroom and start interviewing and writing again. So I guess by the, end of, by the end of the day, I'd probably written 12 hours. And you get to the point where that's, that's normal for you. I mean, it's probably not, it's what we would probably, of psychiatrists would probably call obsessive. And I guess it is because if, if I'm not writing, I feel kind of lost. I, I, I don't know what to do. So any other questions out there? Yes. Yes, I love your books. You're great. I've met you around Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. It was difficult for you. It was difficult for you. There was time, but you left your wonderful character behind. Oh, yeah. That was heartbreaking. It was. It was heartbreaking for me. Yeah. You have to love your characters or you don't stick with them. That's right. That's right. When you started, I didn't sense you were, you were so not yet enough. That's right. Can you tell me when, what scene, or was it before you even started writing, that you fell in love with Joe and said she yeah, um, I told you that Zoe is from Alabama, and my family is from Alabama, and I've spent a lot of time there when I was a kid, and we know what things were like in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s in Alabama. There was a member of my family, it wasn't me, a member of my family, a woman, got pregnant by a black man, and they had to leave the state. They had to leave the state. In, 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 my friend, in my Paris books, Zoe's child is stolen away by her, her family because they don't want anyone to know that she gave birth to a, a child who was half white, half black. Um, and when I was doing the family history, I was able to get in touch with that that woman who's now a, a mom of a bunch of kids, happy as heck and not living in Alabama. Um, and when I was interviewing her for the, fam the, the Webb family book, The History, I got this feeling. And this was before I came up with Zoe. And just listening to my cousin tell the story of how she was treated and how her husband was treated, it just, it, it broke my heart. It broke my heart. Um, and so I wasn't going to do that part in, in, in the Zoe books. But once I started writing, my, my, my cousin's story came to me, and I realized, oh, my God, what she's gone through. And, and then, in, as you know, in, in the book, the first book, um, Lost in Paris, her husband, Pete, he was a musician, is killed in World War I. Um, he was a member of the Harlem Hellfighters, and he, was rece he received a post posthumous medal for his bravery. Um, it, it, it just, all of those days in the civil rights movement, which I was involved in, and my cousin's story, 
Zoe wound up with it. So that's how I, that's how I found my Zoe. Thanks for asking that question, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Well, right now I'm working on something different. And uh, one, of the, one of the awful things about a writer's life is you get a series and you love it and you're, you're happy with it. You get an idea for something else that's totally different. And so I, what I will, I've got all my notes and all my work done for the, for the next book, but I am currently writing. You would have to call it kind of surrealistic or for those of you who recognize a certain f couple of names, Monty Python meets C.S. Lewis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so uh, I got that idea for some reason while I was writing Zoe, maybe because Zoe is a very different type of person. She's, she's, she's got the creativity and the love and the passion of a writer. A, a <laughs> writer boy, talk about a Freudian slip, of, of, of an artist. But at the same time, she's very, she's, she's just an organized human being, which you generally don't find out with artists. So anyway, th that's how, where I got the idea, and it, I think it was just floating by on the ozone. How do you define success as a uh, writer? <laughs> it, not by money, that's for sure. I, I, I think I have to define success personally, for doing something I'm proud of, um, for coming up with a book that I know other people love just as much as I do. It's like you, you brought up, you brought up um, my, first, my first series, the Desert Series, and Lena Jones. Um, so many people love Lena. And who knows, someday, Lena was the daughter I never had. I had sons. And with all the misery that, that oh, geez, fights, fights, oh, gosh. Um, but I, I may go back to, to Lena someday. Uh, I will only say this. Whenever I write a series, there's always a happy ending. So never... You never have to worry about me killing somebody you really love, because I won't do it. There's, I believe in happy endings. It's, I guess it's all those fairy tales my folks read to me when I was a kid. How do you know in a series when to end it? Well, <coughs> with, with, Lo with uh, Lena and the Desert series, I had already told Barbara that I was going to write 10 books in that series. And so going into the very 10th book, I knew what I had to do. If, if I ever, that probably was the most organized book I, I wrote because I couldn't be that much of a pantser because I had to tie up all of these loose ends. Nothing makes me crazier than, than a writer who just, I get so excited about the book. And then I get to the end and, and it's like, wait a minute, what happened to George? So. <laughs> And but by the way, and, and I bet you've got, they've got a lot of fans here. I am addicted to the Midsummer Murders, and I get so upset when they don't tell you what happened to to the killer. <laughs> they don't tell you. We see him arrested, but we don't know if he got life or he has escaped or whatever. I want to be there at the graveside. <laughs> Any other questions? Paris came first. And, and then Zoe, how did Zoe come? Before, you said you fell in love with her, with yeah. the story. Yeah. That came to you. But yeah. I think she developed. Right. And you weren't an artist. Yeah, yes. I know you mentioned Hemingway. Right, yeah. With, with Hemingway, see, I, I do a lot of teaching of, cre of creative writing. And those of you, how many of you have read Lost in Paris? Okay, I, I, I've said, in that book, I said some hard things about Hemingway, who I do not idolize as a human. However, as a writer, yes, I idolize him. So 
I wanted to get the combination of, of Hemingway as a person and yet Hemingway as a genius. So, and the same thing kind of happened with, with the next book, um, The Clock Strike Murder, except I was kind of hoping that, that, that Mark Chagall would turn out to be kind of a nasty guy. No, he was a, ba oh, he was a sweetie. He was so nice. He was a doll. Um, and so I wound up putting his wife in and his little kid in, and it's just so. <sighs> we never know where the trip is going to take us. When we, when we, once upon a time, when you say that, oh, and I just remembered something when I was talking about that. My mother, who was probably one of the most uncreative persons I'd ever met, um, or at least I thought she was one of the most uncreative persons I ever met. I remember when I was very young, four, five, six, she would tell me a bedtime story at night that she was making up as she told it. And it was a series of stories called The Three Little Cars. And I had one of those little red fire engines, you know, that you, and I hung out with two boys that each had little pedal cars. And so we would all go out and pedal up and down the streets together ourselves. And mom made up adventures for the three little cars. So stuff that you can't even remember goes into making a writer. Because I, I only just recently remembered that, the three little car story. <laughs> okay, ah. this is a tough question, uh -oh. Betty. Yeah. Can you really teach someone writing? You can teach them to be a better writer. That's what you can do. You cannot teach them soul. Because if you don't have soul, you're not going to write a book that anyone cares about. Because when people are reading, and I'm a reader, so I'm speaking for myself as a reader here, not as a writer. If a book has no soul, I'm going to put it down. And I don't care how wonderful all of the critics say it has been. If it has no soul, I'm out of there. I'm out of there. So that you can't teach. But you can teach, don't use double negatives, you can teach how to, f how to make a character come alive. I learned that with Lena Jones right off the bat, how to make her come alive. And that's why I gave her the, the background I did, that she was a foster child, and it kind of hardened her. And so she goes through life with great bravery, but she tries to have a hard heart but she's always failing at that because she, she's a softie. She really is, but she's trying her best not to let anybody know. Any others? Yeah. Thank you. And there's another writer, by the way. Oh, that creep. Yes, there's a real poet in my book who lived, real poet, real jerk. In fact, I had talked about that. Let's see if I can, oh, I used this yesterday. Uh, let's see, where are we, where are we? Ah. Okay, whoops, wrong one. Well, yeah, he's, he's a real poet, and he really did take those Chagalls that he found and sold them and enriched himself. And he, he was supposedly Chagall's best friend, but obviously he was not because he used that money. And so I had to, that's another thing I had to find out. I had to read a biography of that man, and what a jerk. Um, <laughs> what a jerk. Let's see what... I think I mentioned his name in here. Um, ba -dum, ba -dum. Let's see, did I not? Well, yeah, uh, you may be. Uh, let's see. Oh no, he's with the real people. I d I talked about. Sadly, um, Hemingway, Kiki, Cassette, Gertrude, Blaze and Drars, Blaze and Drars. 
you talk about a phony. Um, and his poetry, I thought it was horrible. I mean, it, sound, it sounded like a travelogue, but he was all the rage of 20s Paris, all the rage. Yeah, yeah. And, and to, to go back to answer another part of that question, um, Paris came first. Um, my love affair with Paris, I mean, uh, what can I say? I, I kind of get choked up when I talk about Paris. But Paris is the, I think, the only place other than, believe it or not, Arizona, I ever felt at home. I know that sounds weird, but, but the minute I got off that plane in Paris when in 1976, I felt like I'd come home. Oh, I do have, have one thing that I can say. I, like everybody else, or so many people, I decided uh, to have my DNA tested. And uh, I had hopes in certain directions which did not pan out. But by gosh, I'm part French. <laughs> <laughs> what are the books and the authors that made you fall in love with mysteries as a reader? Agatha Christie. Uh, I was a real literature snob when I was younger, uh, in my 20s. I mean, I was just, uh, 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 mysteries, uh, uh. and because I was reading heavy philosophy and all this other stuff, you know. But I was, in other words, I was your basic art student, and um, I, I passed. See, I love garage sales too. Flea markets and garage sales will get me every time. I was driving, I was living in L.A., and I'm driving past a garage sale, and I'm thinking, oh, maybe they'll have some books. So I get out, and there they've got a big carton of books for something, I think it was like four bucks. And the top was John Updike, Philip Roth, Hemingway, I mean, all of these snooty, snooty writers. So I paid the, 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 the five bu the buck, I think it was five bucks, yeah put it in my trunk and brought it home. And then I, when I got home, I'm looking to see what else is in there. Maybe the Greeks, maybe the Romans. And I'm going through, snob that I am. After the first layer, it was nothing but Agatha Christie's. And I thought, I have been cheated. Well, a couple of weeks later, I got a bad case of the Asian flu. I mean, I was one sick puppy. And I was laying in bed, just sick, 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 and thinking maybe I should read something. So I take what little strength I have, I reach down out of the bed. It was one of these fold-up beds that fold up into the walls. I was so broke, so poor, and, which was okay because I was an artist. So I've, I'm going through, and I just pick up one of these books that are beneath contempt, beneath contempt. And I think this one was... Um, the killing, of murder of Roger Ackroyd, I believe. Yeah, so I'm reading it. And what? <laughs> what? What? By the time I got better, I had read all of those books. I mean, and I have got a piece of about uh, of Agatha Christie that you might enjoy and you might not have noticed. Agatha Christie drops a clue. It's either real or it's not every 11 pages, because I did a study of it, 11 pages. You'll get red herrings, most of them are red herrings, but in among the red herrings are real clues. Yeah, yeah. call me an Agatha Christie lover, uh, an admirer, she's my idol, I mean, what a woman. What a In fact, last night I watched um, uh, one of those streaming movies about Agatha Christie. And the, she disappeared for nine days. She had her own mystery. Any more questions? Before we conclude, can you tell us what's coming next? You hinted. Well, th I, I can't say too much about that because I'm, I'm, m members of my critique group know what I'm writing. And um, there's been a certain amount of noses turning up, like, what are you doing? And now they're kind of getting it. Um, but I can't talk about it. Um, <laughs> there is a lot of Monty Python in there. Besides Agatha Christie, some of my favorite Brits are Monty Python. But there will be a third Paris mystery? Theoretically. Theoretically, yes. Theoretically, yeah. It's real original. <laughs>
I, you're talking about the the th the thing I'm writing now. Yeah, she says it's real original, and she's a member of my critique group, so she knows. <laughs> and it is, it's real. Okay, we we've, we've got the least the least strange thing in it is a talking cat. So. And how can readers find out about your books? Are you on social media? Yeah, I'm on Facebook. Uh, you can look for me there. And my, it's easy to find my, my uh, web, web address. It's just bettyweb-mystery.com. And the Betty Web is it's with two Bs. You know that, web. And uh, it's all one word, bettyweb-mystery.com. Last questions? One last question? Yeah. Oh, I know. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> yes, it's my when when I found that I, my husband says, "Well, you need to fix that," and I said, "I don't think I will." <laughs> I mean, I'm old, but but I you but you've got to admit I look really great for 120. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Barbara's gonna be so jealous. <laughs> Barbara will be so jealous. Yes, she will. She yes, out. she will. Barbara looks pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I want to thank uh, Betty for taking time to be with us today. Thank you for joining us either in person or virtually. Jake will go ahead and shut off the live stream. Um, and Betty will, is here to sign books, but you need to give us a minute. We'll get her positioned yeah. at the table. If you want to fold up your chairs, put them to the side over where it says road trip. Um, we have more copies of her books up front. Thank you all, and thank you, Betty. Yeah. And thank you all for showing up. I really appreciate it. Uh, your phone shut off before I could take any pictures. Oh, no. But I took a whole bunch, and I'll Okay, send them thank you. you. Thank yes. you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad 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 I'm so glad